Um, so this next panel actually is, is great, uh, com coming off the back of that conversation uh, between Michael and Emily, um, because I want to introduce Mark Hansen, who is the director of the Brown Institute for Media Innovation. Uh, we actually share the space with them downstairs. If you don't know anything about their work, I really would recommend having a look at what they're doing, because they really do encompass this relationship between journalism and Silicon Valley. Um, Helen Gurley Brown gave money to the Columbia Journalism School, but also Stanford Engineers. Um, and they work together to create some amazing stuff. So we said to Mark, can you moderate this panel? Uh, and we've already had some great conversations downstairs over the last week about exactly some of the things that Michael was raising around when uh, you know, journalists are having to rely on platforms for distribution, how much do they th have to think about those platforms in terms of how they tell their stories? So um, Mike, uh, Mark here is joined on stage by Rainey and, and um, Mario and Nicholas and Trusha, um, and they're going to talk about some of their examples. Thank you, Claire. Um, and just for what it's worth, if you think it's cold out there, <laughs> it's really cold up here. Um, so, uh, I, I, Nicholas, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> You're the least dressed of us. Um, all right, so, so thank you, Claire, for the introduction. So in approaching this panel, I've been thinking that this session is ultimately about experimentation with platforms. And it, it all kind of, it, it'll, what we'll see is the, the way in which you, you uh, interpret the word with is how we might place ourselves on a spectrum. So in some cases, we have people, um, uh, uh, panelists who are um, entering into collaborations with engineers, um, who are entering into collaborations with the platform to alter the platform. And in other cases, we have people working with the platform as a platform. So there's sort of a spectrum that's being, that, that we, might, we might sort of pull out o o um, over the course of this conversation. And I hope um, that what you see out of this session is the different kinds of relationships between content and, and platform providers. You know, it can be hard to start conversations between these two groups. Um, as Emily alluded to, what would you do if, I, if you were in my place? That's a really difficult question to start with um, for each side of the conversation because it presumes publishers know what might be possible um, and it presumes that platform, uh, platform uh, folks understand editorial values and that both are able to predict what we might uh, take to be a quantum of journalism in five or ten years. So part of what we want to talk about is the role of collaboration between platform and content, and that's what we're going to we'll spend some time with. So um, we're going to, I guess, wow, there is some organization here. We are going to go in the, in the, in the order in which they foolproofed it for me, uh, the order in which people are, are sitting. So um, each, each uh, member of the panel will have between five and seven minutes, which I suppose equates to seven minutes, um, to talk a little bit about their, um, about their experiences and and how they're working with platforms, um, and then we'll have a series of questions. So, Trushar, you're first. Uh, and I guess I get to be timekeeper, so if you could glance over here periodically, okay. I'll tell you how much time you have. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so over the last uh, 18 months or so, uh, one of the areas that I've been working a lot at uh, BBC News has been trying to uh, figure out what we should be doing on messaging platforms. Um, when we first started uh, at the beginning of 2014, it was a very interesting experience, very similar to what Mark was just sort of alluding to earlier, which was when we approached a number of these chat platforms. Uh, we didn't know what we were supposed to be doing on these platforms, uh, um, but then equally they had never been approached by a news organization in, in most of those cases, so they didn't know whether there was any news proposition for their platforms either. Um, and so we spent quite a f uh, I would probably say the first half of uh, 2014 just figuring out if, if there was any proposition at all um, and played around with different types of formats, uh, different uh, platforms and tried to figure out whether um, they work better in some parts of the world than others. Um, and so I just wanted to talk you through some of the um, uh, sort of, I guess, projects which uh, have proven to be quite successful for us um, in slightly different ways. Um, so the, the first one to mention, and I guess it's the one that's had probably the most high profile uh, coverage, has been uh, what we were doing on WhatsApp uh, back end of last year, particularly during the um, outbreak of the Ebola uh, virus uh, in West Africa. Uh, we'd experimented a little bit with WhatsApp uh, earlier in the year uh, with the Indian elections, and what we tried to do was effectively create a sort of a, a push news service inside the platform. Um, 
and the initial uh, feedback we got from a lot of the users who managed to subscribe to that Indian election service was that they really, really loved the service, but it was an absolute pain in the backside for us to actually manage that because WhatsApp isn't built to be a platform to push out content in a mass way and there's no CMS and everything has to happen from a mobile phone um, and I know a number of news organizations have gone through their own journey of pain over the last year uh, discovering this very simple truth as well um, but what we did do was uh, because it was a very specific public service remit that World Service had that we really wanted to try and serve our audiences particularly in West Africa um, we sort of just sort of uh, took the pain and uh, just made the um, project work by hiring, uh, well, bringing in a couple of producers full-time just to work on WhatsApp, which was quite a big investment, but it was something that we felt was really, really important. Um, what we actually did on the platform was quite simple. Uh, one of the things we realized was that it needed to be uh, an, a way for us to be able to deliver content directly onto people's mobile phones without then ha them having to uh, go on an additional onward journey of referral back to our own platforms. And so everything we posted, uh, it was sort of an end destination in itself. Um, we were very aware of the limitations of uh, data for many people in West Africa. And so we wanted to make our content as simple and clear to understand as possible. And we sort of had a strategy of using visuals, uh, of using text and using audio, so that we were able to cover different levels of literacy in um, that part of the world. Um, and it was a mixed language service in English and French, so that we hopefully were able to hit as many people um, with the relevant information uh, as possible. Um, and then Snapchat uh, is a very different platform um, to, to WhatsApp. Uh, a number of news organizations are on Discover, BBC News isn't on Discover. But we had been thinking about for a while how we could use the sort of, I guess, the regular bit of Snapchat, the stories um, uh, element of it, to uh, try and experiment around BBC News content. Uh, I know a number of news organizations have already tried this. Um, my observation has always been that they tended to be much more sort of lighter and slightly fluffier type of coverage uh, uh, that they, they would focus on Snapchat. Um, and we sort of tried to think of almost challenging ourselves, could you tell a really serious story but do it on Snapchat to see if actually people who are users of Snapchat would, act, would find that useful or interesting. Um, and one area of BBC News, which is probably the slowest to really adopt the, sort of the digital age, has been our documentaries uh, and current affairs division, which has been fairly uh, old school around television. Um, and so as a result of that, one of the things that we've been really trying to push over the last three, four months is um, how can we make that uh, production system much more digital? Um, and the BBC Panorama program, which is one of our flagship current affairs programs, um, were commissioned to do a, a big piece uh, around the refugee crisis in Europe. And uh, John Sweeney, one of our um, main uh, reporters on that program, was assigned that task. And we decided to send uh, a digital producer to go with him and we wanted to see whether we could use Snapchat as a way of documenting that story uh, and following that journey around. Um, and so this is uh, a, an example of some of the um, snaps that we produce. Um, one of the things that was really interesting about this was that we then pulled a sort of a, a, a collection of all these individual slaps, uh, slaps into a single um, video of about 10 minutes, which were then published back out onto social media. And it became effectively our first ever sort of documentary in a portrait form. Um, and again, this is one of the things that really um, has been really interesting about using these sorts of platforms is that quite often they help drive our thinking around innovation of these sorts of spaces. Um, because you know BBC News doesn't have any means of pu uh, publishing portrait video on our own platform, but Snapchat almost forces us to have to think about those sorts of things. Um, and another uh, newer, um, chat app, uh, particularly big in the US uh, and Canada, is Yik Yak, which some of you may have heard of. Um, and it's mostly seen as a fairly inoffensive, uh, well, uh, maybe maybe not so inoffensive with, with news this week, but generally um, it's seen as a, a fairly uh, innocuous sort of platform for, for, for people to share comments uh, uh, anonymously. But we partnered with Yik uh, Yik Yak uh, during the Canadian elections and we got them to post questions to their users in the country to ask what they thought about the election and then they would upvote what were the best messages and we posted that back up 
uh, onto our own website uh, as well. And the final thing to, to mention was a platform which is quite um, new and quite small compared to some of the giant uh, chat apps in the market. It's a platform called Telegram. Um, the reason why it's so interesting is that it's the first uh, op genuinely open source chat platform that I've ever come across. Um, and it's also highly encrypted. And for that reason, uh, people in Iran, for example, uh, have been taking it up as the main communication tool of choice. We decided to launch uh, a BBC Persian news channel inside Telegram, and about this is just about three weeks ago. And inside the first uh, week or so, we had uh, 100,000 subscribers. Um, and one post there, where you can see the guy holding his hands, that's actually the Iranian foreign minister who's just unveiled a statue of himself. Um, and that reached 800,000 unique users just inside Telegram. Um, and so this is just another example of how we're beginning to now think about these platforms almost in a sort of a digital circumvention way uh, as well. So those are a, qu a quick run through of things. Thank you very much. Right, so, so Business Insider decided to launch a new publication, a, a general interest publication, and we thought about how to do that. And we thought, oh, there we go, okay, great. This, this chart was on my mind when we started thinking about how to do it. This is from, um, it's done by the Pew Research Center, but the New York Times had this in their state of the company uh, internal report on what's going on, and they were looking at their own homepage traffic. And I just love this chart because it shows a few years ago, 2002, um, uh, people, people like to uh, check news at regular time, and uh, half of people did that, and about half of people just kind of bumped into it from time to time. And then, as you can see, just by 2012, that had really uh, spread out, so actually a lot more people just started bumping into news and no longer checked it from time to time. Uh, and that was three years ago, and I think that trend's probably only continued. And uh, you know, what, what this really gets at to me is that uh, people are less and less going to a website to get their news, to you know, uh, some, some place. They're sort of bumping into it on Facebook and social channels like Twitter, but mostly, let's be honest, Facebook. Another stat that was in my uh, mind as we started building this thing is that 88% of millennials get their news from Facebook. So we said, okay, great, so we wanna build um, a, a general interest publication that gives people stories they wanna know where they want it. And so we thought about what that is, and we thought, okay, it's social channels, and then we thought, what kind of stories are working on social channels, and uh, video is the big one. And so video is huge, it really matters, and then we also learned that 80% of people who watch videos on their phones, and by the way, they're all mobile, or at least the vast majority are mobile, are doing it while uh, not having the sound on. We actually talked to Facebook as we started to think about how to build these things, and they said, imagine your viewer, your user, your consumer is someone who's in line at the grocery store and looking for a quick piece of information, some sort of story to you know, learn more. And so we have developed a video that is uh, audio optional and has text on screen and lasts between 45 and 45 seconds and, and a minute 30. Sometimes we go long form and go as long as three minutes. Um, so we have some videos to show you kind of, it's just easier to show you what we do. So here we go. Is the audio going to work? Well, the way that we're walking through the line and stuff like that, people was already looking at us like, Man, like it was, it was awful. I mean, it's like first time I ever felt that here in the United States, to be honest with you. Then security started rounding us, uh, and the supporters of Donald Trump started uh, cursing at us, saying, "Go back to Mexico. You shouldn't be here. This is our country." So it's like, you guys got to leave, you're trespassing. If you want to do something like that, go to Hillary uh, rally. You know, like, I got, every, I got every right to be here. I was talking crap and cursing at me, so at that moment, told him, I pay taxes, 
just like you do here. And he, that's when he spit on my face. So I thought about my son, I thought about my wife, and I uh, thought about what was the reason that I was there. If I would have hit this guy, I would have lost the whole purpose of myself being there. person enters the classroom and my, my kids are there, I want them to do whatever they can to disrupt that person's thought process and to fight back any way they can. How you like it, huh? Let me, let me ask you this, did you guys feel less empowered or more empowered? Is this something you can go back to your schools, your churches, your homes, your loved ones, and then, and then empower them with the life skill? For me, as a, as a principal, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with telling students to an attack an intruder. You're gonna make fun of me! How you like me now? You're gonna make fun of me! And how do you tell a parent that I picked your kid to attack? It's basically empowering people to have more information to make more decisions for themselves. media quintet first. I'm uh, a person who deals with legacy uh, organizations most of the time. So a lot of you will be able to identify uh, with what I'm going to mention here. And I, I still, I used to deal with a media quartet until about uh, two months ago, and now we have a smart watch. So how do you get a traditional newsroom to be aware that social media has changed how the notion of frequency works in a newsroom and that you have to actually deal with the story first and then various platforms, the smartwatch, the tablet, online, print. And to me, the basic stuff that I deal with in my workshops is that we're dealing with two tempos. And we've seen that in the previous presentation. People are leaning forward all day long to check on mobile devices. They lean back at certain times of the day, not necessarily in the evening, but in the last two or three focus groups I've been involved with, I've come to the realization that we are leaning forward almost all day long. We might be reading on that tablet at night and we want to get a sense of news. So this is the, what we do all day long and this is basically many of the readers who read in print are doing that as a lean back, not expecting any breaking news, anything earth shattering in there. Um, how do I explain it to editors? I said, all day long, you are throwing raw meat to the lions out there. I mean, they come in through social media, they are going to grab a headline on social media, and they come and read you. So you are basically 
dealing with this raw meat all day long. At the same time, that newsroom has to prepare the cook steak. You have to deal with, with a lean back moment, with how an investigative report, how a longer analysis will be presented. And, and so we come into mobile, star, you know, mobile storytelling, which is so key to a lot of what I've heard here uh, today. Um, I have to say that Scandinavians, as far as I'm concerned, are ahead of the pack. And uh, when I work with Scandinavians, I realize that they are more adventurous. They really are more experimental and less fear of failure than the Americans do. So one of my favorite projects has been in Norway, Aften Posten, where this is like sort of the New York Times of Norway. And when the editor retired, they hired a young editor who only had experience with digital. Picture a legacy American newspaper hiring a totally digitally minded editor who never worked in print uh, to run it. So I learned tons of lessons in here. The first thing he asked me is why is it that we do this to people on mobile platforms? We just throw a lot of text in there. Shouldn't be. This is not the platform for that. And so I started thinking a little bit of history and of course I can deal with history. I'm the oldest person in this panel by at least 30 years on a good day. And so, 42 years in this business, I know why we do that. When we went to journalism, we learned, to journalism school, we learned that people forget from day to day. That's when you were doing a newspaper every 24 hours. So you have to type a type back paragraph to remind me of what happened yesterday. Many editors are still doing this today, except that we're coming back to check on the story every 10 seconds. So you don't need to do that. So we began to create a series of how do we tell stories in the digital age. We do story segments. Let's say, for example, we did a prototype with Malaysia's flight. If this is the one story of the day that most people are going to be following on their mobile devices, you don't need to give me the entire story all the time. So you can do a template where what you have is three quotes on the story. Another one might be the outline, three points, maybe two hours later. And then you might even have a photo gallery in the middle of the lunchtime. Uh, you might have a commentary that will appear later in the day, but you get the commentator to give you 10 or 15 lines. So these story segments are components of the whole story package, but you are dealing with them in very short takes because people are coming to these story uh, with very little time in what I call at a glance journalism, journalism of interruptions. You're coming in and going out very quickly. And so at the end of the day, you know, in case you have not been checking your mobile, you can have a string of elements that really ties the story together. Um, so we're going to tell stories in different ways. The New York Times does it. You know, just recently, this is a story that most of us read. And that may lure you to read it in the long form. But you got it there in that card first. Uh, this is one of my favorites, you know, the upshot. They use cards and headlines. The Washington Post does it very effectively with live events. During the debate, they're giving you these quotes, as they go, you don't have to tell me that there is a debate going on. I already know that. This, simple as it appears, is very difficult for traditional editors of a certain age to understand. They, it's not, you know, you have to give me the headline, you have to give me the, the entire scope of the story. And so, in the era of at a glance journalism, we have to develop new forms of telling stories, in addition to the long narrative, which is still there. It's not going to disappear. Uh, when we're telling stories on the smartwatch, basically what you're doing is providing headlines, bullets. That's what you're doing. And two or three bullets is all that I'm going to pay attention to. Uh, we are beginning to see not only that um, this is happening with mobile, but I think that we are seeing the end of the home page. All the people at Quartz this week are telling us that they are going to renew their home page. But Again, going to Afton Poston, in my last visit there two weeks ago, this digital editor told me, we produce a thousand front pages every day. And that is true, because the front page is how people come into your brand traditionally. So now, they are coming, um, not through the front door, but through the back door. And we have to create article pages where, which become front pages, home pages. The article page where you tell me what else is happening and how it's happening, Quartz does it very effectively, but we are going towards a system of cards probably. If I'm going to come in through Facebook or Twitter, it's going to be more than a link. It's going to have to be something like this that gives you your brand and entices you to read more. And I think that's basically explainers and cards are going to be a very important part. You may see homepages that would look like this. 
not like traditional home pages. They will have probably more of the single takes for single stories as they will play in mobile. Thank you very much. That was like America. Well, seven, seven minutes is not very long for him, but you guys did a great job. Um, it's always good to be at Columbia. I was thinking about starting by saying that one of the, the best indicators of things moving on is that we're having these conversations at Columbia. Last night I was here talking about our virtual reality project that we did with Tao. So the fact that these conversations are happening at what used to be a more traditional journalism school is amazing, and that Mark is here too. Um, so I, I run Frontline, and we made a couple of decisions a year or two ago now, it's about 18 months ago, to restructure our entire digital team. Um, and I think by restructuring, we really changed the environment inside Frontline. What we did is we combined digital with audience, and we combined that with the big documentary films that Frontline is so known for. So now we work in teams, and I think that biggest shift to reorganize how we do what we do has meant a complete change and has really been inspiring for me to see that we could do it. So what we do now is we say, our journalism, the big ideas that we have is at the center of what we do, but we distribute across as many platforms as we can do well. And that means that we don't move on to every platform until I really feel convinced that we can do it in a substantial way, in a way that we can sustain, and frankly, in a frontline way. So we can talk a bit about that. So, what we learned about a year and a half ago started with our relationship with YouTube. And since we're talking about Silicon Valley today, I think it's really important to say that YouTube approached Frontline to say, we want you in our partnership program, and I said yes. What that meant was that we worked together, not editorially, but in distribution terms, and we were taught essentially by the folks inside YouTube about how to distribute our content. I can't really begin to tell you guys how important that was for us, how eye-opening it was for us, and humbling. One of the first things we learned, for example, is that we had to tell stories completely differently. Now, we are visual storytellers, so I think our leap into this space might be a little more easy than it is for print and text writers, but I do think that we had a lot of business to do to change, and, and it took a cultural shift for us as well. These are some of our biggest takeaways. And one of the biggest things I found, and this is one of the most encouraging things I think in this landscape, is I don't really think it has to be as short as people think it has to be. Now, I'm biased, right? I run Frontline, so I'm clearly a long-form person, but we have found some of our most successful films on YouTube, and I would dare say on Facebook too, are longer than conventional wisdom as long as you're telling the story in the right form. So when I talk about this, I mean to say it shouldn't be long because you want it to be long. It should be long because the story tells you it should be a little bit longer. And you should be constantly checking yourself to make sure that you're telling a good story. And if you do, people will stick with you of all generations. So then we moved on to Facebook. Now, I had this funny conversation with Mark earlier to say that we were, we were infants on Facebook in the spring because they launched their player, and now we're almost teenagers. Maybe we're in middle school. I'll compromise on middle school. <laughs> so we have found an incredible difference on YouTube from Facebook. And actually, what you saw my colleagues show you just now is really how we're starting to tell stories. And again, this is a very foreign court. This format is very foreign to those of us at Frontline. But we have a great cross-generational thing happening where we're all talking. And it's really vital to know that there are platforms where you tell certain stories and platforms where you tell other stories. I'm going to show you one, and then I'm going to move on.
version of what we like to do on Facebook. It's counterintuitive, it gets your attention, and it's related to a really big effort that we've been doing consistently in the war in Syria since the beginning. So we've done seven very big projects on Syria. These never happen out of the blue. We actually did get extraordinary access into Assad's regime over the last six months. So when we do a project, we try to look at it from all sorts of different angles. And this one we thought would be resonant with, with the Facebook audience, and in fact it was. Um, so we have a little exciting news that we're just gonna share, and I hope we can pull this up. But Facebook, speaking of Facebook, um, has just launched something that they're calling Facebook Spherical Video. So if you have iOS 9, it plays the best on your mobile phones. And essentially, it's what they call the gateway to VR, but essentially what it is is spherical video that you can look at in 360 on your phone or on the web. So you don't actually have to put your goggles on, which I think is really quite interesting. So I don't know if we can show this today, but if we can't, were you guys able to load it? Well, this is this is an interesting new. <laughs> so we can't actually. If you can't get that to work, I'll just talk about why it's so important. So speaking of new story forms, I think this is a really fascinating new form. And I think essentially this is going to be a space that people can have access to VR and this idea of 360 video much more accessibly. And the post-production, which if you've ever heard about VR and story forums, is tough. Oh, here we go. Cool. In late 2013, a microscopic virus began a deadly journey. It leapt from animal host to human victim. It was the beginning of the worst Ebola outbreak in history. If you go to the morgue, you see dead bodies, 15, 16, 17, 18, dead bodies all in, in body bags. The killer virus was unidentified for three months. By then, hundreds of people were infected. So I was afraid it would just be this like black plague with uh, this inexorable spread across the continent and beyond. By summer 2014, the outbreak was completely out of control. There were bodies in the street, there were no safe burials, there were no treatment center. Uh, it can only go one way. There were hundreds of new infections each week and cases in the U.S. So this goes on for about seven more minutes, which is my whole speech. So what I would say is because Mark really wanted us to focus on story forms, that you're seeing these new platforms really expand the way you can tell stories. My only advice to those of you who work in news organizations, either at a leadership level or at a producing level, is to start to dive into these spaces because it's literally in situations like spherical video, it's the beginning of a new form. It's really exciting. It can be daunting at times, but our experience at Frontline has been that the more we dive in and the more we lean in, the better our work has been. So we can talk about more about that. Thanks. Um, thank you all. That was that was really inspiring work, and I it, I think it, it it highlights the differences in the ways in which we're tackling these new um, or addressing these new platforms. I have a few questions, um, some for each of you, and then some for the group. Um, I'm going to start with Trushar. At the break, um, I asked you uh, whether you'd come across a chat app that couldn't be used for some journalistic purpose, and you said no. In fact, they'd, so far, you'd, everyone you'd found could be, um, and gave me an example of, of, of Yo, and I wonder if you could recount that story for me. Sure. So during the course of my research, um, I came across a bunch of different um, chat apps, and you know, they all had different functionality, but I could see that you know, maybe not for the BBC, but for other news organizations, there could be some value in, the, in them doing something. And then I came across Yo. And I thought, yes, this is finally an app that actually has no useful purpose at all. Um, for those of you who are, you may be aware of it, so when it first launched, um, most people weren't quite sure whether it was a joke or whether it was real, but it received like a million dollars of VC funding. Um, and basically what it does, for those of you not familiar with it, you download it, um, it will scan 
uh, your phone's address book and see how many other friends of yours are on Yo. And then you can just push a button and it will send them an audible Yo as a push alert to them. And that's all it does. Um, so I was convinced, right, I'm, you know, this is, has no purpose at all. But then I thought, let me just call, call them anyway, just find out what they're thinking and uh, you know, why they think this app has any future. Um, and then actually I started talking to them and they said, well, actually we're building out uh, something called the Yo Store, which is uh, a separate platform for brands to set up their own uh, Yo accounts that normal Yo users can subscribe to. And I, s and I thought, well, what's the point of that? Um, and they said, well, if you have a brand, a sort of official account on Yo, then it has a little bit of extra functionality. So when you push out a Yo, it will also uh, allow you to include a link and potentially uh, an image. Um, and so we played around with it a little bit. Um, so we sort of set up a, an, an account for our BBC trending team, which looks at a lot of sort of social trends on, uh, on the web and seeing what's going viral. And we initially just set up an account and, um, which allows people to get a sort of a Yo alert and a link whenever we think something interesting is going viral. Um, but actually, much more, much more recently, Yo have been speaking to a number of their news partners, including us, um, saying, you know, can you think a bit more about what the purpose of your Yo account is? Um, so be like really clear, if someone is subscribing to your Yo channel, they need to know why they're getting this Yo right now. Um, and it needs to have a real purpose, otherwise they won't subscribe to your channel. Um, and it was interesting because it forced us to think about notifications in a way that we'd never really thought about notifications in that level of super spe specificity, as it were. Um, and so we have tried to think about okay, what, what sort of a Yo account might work. And then uh, it was around that time that there was a lot of controversy around the FIFA president, Seth, Seth Blatter, and all the corruption scandal that was going around uh, at the World Football Governing Body. Um, and so we came up with this idea, let's set up an account called Blatter Watch. And what it would do is, it, the, the description was, BBC News will yo you if Sepp Blatter resigns. And so effectively, it was just a one notification lifetime service <laughs> channel. Um, and as it happened two days later, he resigned. Um, and so we'd acquired, you know, two, three hundred sub subscribers by then. And it was one of the greatest pleasures I've had this year of pushing out <laughs> A yo, a yo alert when Sepp Blatter resigned. So I guess the point is that even when you think something is ridiculous, you were talking about, you know, well, Grindr. There's no way you could have a news application for Grindr. Um, but BBC News probably wouldn't. But, you know, I can imagine that if you were a different type of news organization, there would be ways. This was in response to the question, could there be a chat app that didn't have it? It's not like I just sort of volunteered that. But anyway, so that gives you an example of the sort of thing you right. could do. No, and, and I, I, what I liked about that example, thank you for that, uh, what I liked about that example was the idea that with the narrowest possible channel, one could imagine a new kind of, of journalism. And had you had more than two or 300 subscribers, I could imagine a, a square in Madrid or London with a sea of yo's going off in a moment. And, and then that simple act, a, a group of people sharing some national event in a way that wasn't shareable before, and, and sort of kicking the notion of story or of what, what an act of journalism looks like down the road a little bit. I, I like that quite a lot. Um, uh, so thank you mostly for that story. <laughs> so um, now, so in, in my role at Brown, with its pairing, as Claire alluded to, at Stanford Engineering and the J School here, we have to constantly um, sort of balance the ethics and values, the, ethic, the academic and professional cultures between engineering and journalism. and, and if, if, if we think about some of the experiments or the collaborations, they, they force us, as you've described, they force, they force the journalists or the engineers to fall back on their core values. What is journalism? Um, how, how does this serve our users? Um, we have interesting sort of discussions about audience versus users. These mean different things. These have different framings, um, suggest different responsibilities. Um, and with that said, Rainey, maybe you can ex discuss a little bit about what, it, what it's like working with your platform partners. And I know in our conversation earlier, I, so I asked you a question. When you're in a room uh, with Facebook, for example, uh, is Facebook sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, we're in a room with Frontline? Or is, are you thinking, oh my gosh, I'm in a room with Facebook? Like, how does that, how does that work? <laughs> um, so I've actually been really encouraged by the people we've been working with at Facebook and YouTube. I think actually a lot of them are quite like-minded. Um, I think the people we deal with are mostly former journalists, so there are people who really did want to be journalists, but they have gone into this new world and they actually are really well-meaning. 
I think that it's mutual admiration, and I think we're looking at them, and we're looking at them, they're looking at us, and we're wondering, you know, how can we meet? Um, I think a year and a half ago, we were seen as quite traditional in terms of our broadcast. We hadn't done a lot in terms of short form or moving cross-platform and video. We had done a ton in terms of our website, and we stream our films, so we were really digitally savvy in terms of our actual traditional films. Um, so I think that over the past year and a half now, we can come with something more to the table in the conversation. I do find myself saying to them, please take journalism seriously. I sound so earnest in these rooms sometimes. And I think that it's important to insert a little earnestness into these conversations about if, and Emily's written a lot about this, about how if you're gonna be publishers, in quotes, right, what are your responsibilities to the editorial standards and what about democracy and journalism? And I think that I have that platform in that moment and so I use it to have that conversation. And, and do you find that you, I, I mean, sometimes, sometimes we see the, the, I guess it's a question of mutual respect, right? To understanding, mm -hmm. that, right? To, to be able to have a conversation as, as equals, right? Right, I think absolutely we feel like equals. We feel like, I said earlier, you know, we really move on to these platforms carefully and with a lot of consideration. Um, not that we spend a lot of time, it's more that we wanna really be able to perform well in these, in these environments and we wanna be able to build an audience. It was quite humbling when we started, um, you know, a lot of people on YouTube had never even heard of Frontline. So our digital team was completely distraught by this. And, you know, what? They haven't heard of Frontline? Like, we're the <laughs> biggest thing ever. Well, actually, we're a public media, so we're kind of boutique. Um, and we're a flavor, right? So maybe they don't even know us. So what I said was actually it was the best thing ever for us because that meant we could reintroduce ourselves and, in fact, introduce ourselves to a whole new generation of people who found us on YouTube and when they found us they loved us and what they told us was really crucial they told us to stay serious they love us to be serious but they love a story well told so I really felt like we had to do our jobs even better so it was a kind of challenge to us and it's been a challenge ever since that's excellent um, so Mario and, and Nicholas so so you've adapted your channels in a slightly that notion of with in a different way so you're adapting the, the sort of working with the platform means working with its peculiarities, working with its, with its structures as opposed to with the people who created it to adapt it uh, as in the case of, of, of Trishar describing with, with Yo. So Mario, I'm wondering, so we've gone from quartet to quintet, um, maybe eventually there'll be octet. I don't know what, how, how many tets did you say in our conversation that you I would stop at? I think I'll stop at? at seven. Seven, okay, septet, um, that we would, we would stop at. But, but are there peculiarities of the channels you've been adapting to besides just the bite-sizedness of the content? Like, are, are there things about the watch or the tablet that are different than just having to bring it down to a card it, or something that's... Yeah, I think that primarily, as I, as I said, I work with legacy publications, with editors who have been there in many cases for 20, 25 years, the key issue is not so much the platform for the frequency. The notion that you're not coming here to plan for tomorrow's newspaper, mm -hmm. that it's happening every 15 minutes, is quality now, is not tomorrow's newspaper. So before you even deal with a platform, you're dealing with a total, totally new notion of how you do your work, that you are not planning for tomorrow, but that you are planning for what is going to be next in the next 10 minutes. Once you learn about the notion of frequency and how that has changed and revolutionized what we do, then you have to realize that there are platforms for which our attention span is going to be minimal, you know, right. 45 seconds, uh, two minutes. And you need to write differently. You need to present the information differently for that. Headline writing has never been more important. I mean, it was important when I began my career 42 years ago. The headline writers were some of the best paid people. Well, you have to seduce. You've got to seduce. When you're dealing with a tablet with a phone, you've got to make that finger happy. And in order to do that, uh, you know, you've got to have good headlines that will make you click and go. And so, so the demands are greater, you know. The, the, I tell my students right here at Columbia, it is more difficult to be a journalist storyteller today yes. than he was 10 years ago. 
because you have to deal with not just the different platforms, but the different ways of telling stories and get more into how people consume information. That is the challenge. And, and so Nicholas, you, by, by putting your whole enterprise, <laughs> like putting all the eggs in one basket, like you, start, you started your presentation with a series of statistics about you know, long form for you being three minutes long. <laughs> what, so those statistics were about, um, were about uh, news stories, were about video in, in general. Um, uh, uh, I guess what I'm what I'm interested in is is how you get your information about 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 the design and what other things besides length get affected by by that data and and how do you test if those original impressions were right? Do you actively experiment with length and, and type and that sort of thing? Yeah, we're constantly experimenting, and really the vision for what Insider is going to become over time is yes, actually we're mostly Facebook right now. We're also on Twitter and Instagram and things like that. So the way we think about it is we have at our core, we have some very good storytellers, uh, journalists and storytellers. And um, they go out and they, one of the videos we showed was um, uh, we sent two journalists to an uh, active shooter training in Pennsylvania for teachers. And so they came back with a lot of footage and stories and things like that, obviously, um, and text and, and, and photographs. And eventually what we sort of see is that's the core thing that we have. And then we have um, experts at platforms, in a sense. So right now we have a lot of video editors on the team, who are, uh, and, and, and right now we use them to cut these minute and a half videos, three minute videos for Facebook. But um, we're actually also working on a five minute um, like, um, news magazine piece <laughs> for YouTube, and uh, that, that'll go out. And that one won't have all the text on screen, not as much at least. Um, and then we're also going to probably dice it up into maybe 10 GIFs and put that on Tumblr. Uh, and then, you know, uh, eventually, maybe the next time we send someone out to this live experience, we'll, we'll do the live experience on Snapchat. And so sort of it's at, the, at the core is, the, is uh, our people who understand how to get a great story, and then we just figure out how each platform works. And then certainly there's a lot of feedback. I mean, one thing we learned right away is, you know, we thought that people might be interested in 15 seconds of breaking news. So right when uh, John Boehner resigned, we, um, I was in a meeting, you know, it happens, you just run out of the meeting, like, let's go. You put up a 15 second video, and it was completely ignored uh, by all of our viewers, and, and, uh, and it was the, a sort of a, you learn that on Facebook, the, there is not this like Twitter like push of like immediacy where you can say, this thing happened, don't you all want to know? And because what happens really is Facebook says, oh, that's a nice piece of information, we'll decide when to give it to people. Mm -hmm. um, it's a funny thing, you can put something in, and apparently, and there's a, a big black box here with what happens with Facebook, but it may go out a day later. Um, and just Facebook decided that was the time uh, that was best for you and it and your users. And okay, thanks Facebook. But anyway, so there's there's lots of um, there's lots of like mysteries that we're figuring out all the time. So so I have two closing questions for all for for each of you. Um, one, I'm not sure exactly how to formulate this, but just in what what you were saying and a little in what Rainy was saying, there's. There's maybe a, a notion of, I don't want to use the word because it's overloaded, but like nativeness to what it is that you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that you're not, you're, you, one approach would be to take existing content and carve it up. And so the Syria piece, for example, that you showed Rainy might be thought of as a promo for a longer piece on, on, on Frontline. Um, uh, or Mario, as you had suggested, the little snippets that end up on the watch are promos for things that you will read later. Whereas, Trishar, you described a process whereby um, the, 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 the Yo piece isn't necessarily advertising anything except what it is, right? Or the Ebola piece. It, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's not a link to something else. It is its own conceived of piece in the same way that Nicholas's videos are. So, so is there something that you can say about, about the nature of, of the, the using these platforms as as sort of back doors to, to something more standard versus designing for them straight up, straight up, straight up. Well, I mean, I think that um, we're journalists and we do really in-depth work, so we actually don't see Syria as promotional as much as we see that maybe the people on Facebook won't see our film, but we still feel it's a righteous platform. But if they also want to go see our long-form film, that's amazing for us too. And I think that's really been my own epiphany, that it's okay to me if people see our work on YouTube, but don't watch our broadcast, as long as we're doing quality work in both places and we get you to think 
So that's really our jobs as journalists, right, is to be surprising and, and actually, in our case, investigative and show you something you've never seen before and get you to think. So if I can do that in two or three minutes on Facebook, that feels like a righteous platform for us at Frontline. And that's what we're doing at every, at every point. But I would be disingenuous to say that, of course, I want you to also take the moment to think even harder and see the longer form work that we're committed to. But it's not as promotional as you might think. You know, we really do have respect for these platforms. And, and I would say that that's about a year into us feeling that way, that we really do love that people come to these platforms on their own. So I think it's, it's both and everything, and I think that's healthy. Uh, I was going to say that uh, uh, you're using these mobile devices and the storytelling that goes with them to promote your brand and to make people come back. And we did these Pointer Institute studies in the 1980s of how much time people spend with a daily newspaper in the U.S. And it was the most, it was 23.3 minutes. When we do focus groups today, now people tell you, there are some of my contemporaries who will say, oh, they don't read anymore. People are not with you anymore. They are the average time spent by some of the millennials coming back. If you add together all the different times a day they come to your brand, is 37 minutes average, and it could be more than that. So we are far ahead in terms of exposing the brand than we ever were. But you have to do it, you have to update, and you have to use this storytelling devices to make me want to come back later on. Um, I think the answer is that, you know, when, when, when you don't have this thing at the center anymore, the website or like the news channel that you turn on or like the, the thing that you can go check, which is what I started my presentation with, that you check at a certain time, that's kind of going away, it's eroding, it's, it's disappearing. What you're left with is, um, you know, we want to hit you and what we want to promote, what we want to end leave in your brain is not only like that. We want, to, we want you to feel like that was a great story and I want more of that. So I'm going to subscribe on this channel to what I just saw. But also we want to hit you with that little like sliding insider thing and so that, that, that brand sticks in your brain and next time you start a new public, like someone's like, have you tried uh, Yo? And like, is Insider on Yo? I hope so, because they're, they're always, they've always got the best stories. And so if we're promoting anything, it's like we're just hitting you with great stories, perfect for the platform, so that when you start a new thing, you're like, I gotta go find Insider or else I'm not gonna use this service anymore. Yeah, I think for us it, it really varies on what the point of that particular channel or service is, um, whether it's a referral mechanism or whether it's like an end destination in its own right. Um, and for us, particularly with sort of messaging platforms, it's, they're not just distribution platforms either, that we're increasingly getting a lot of value in that sort of return path where the audience is sending us um, messages back, content back. And so, for example, WhatsApp, although you know, I use the example of the Ebola service as a sort of a push service, strategically for BBC News, WhatsApp is, is now increasingly being used as a UGC platform. Um, and we've had you know, huge success uh, with it, particularly, say, most recently around the Nepal earthquake, where it became the single most effective way for people inside the country to send us messages and content. Um, even when phone lines were down, they could still WhatsApp us. And so it became a, almost a sort of a critical way for us to be able to news gather uh, in those situations. Um, and I think um, uh, for different platforms, there is an opportunity for referrals based on geography. So in the West, in the US and the UK, I, I know that some of these platforms work pretty well as a referral mechanism. But if we posted links in um, one of these messaging platforms in countries um, you know, in, in Africa or parts of Asia where data is a real um, limitation, then we know that no one clicks on links because as soon as they click on a link, it opens up their browser and it starts eating up data. And so we're having to think much more, I guess, in a sophisticated way. And the way others have been saying on this platform, uh, on this, on this platform as well, that um, I think gone are the days when you can have a relatively black and white scenario. You really have to be slice and dice and mix and match based on what's available and what the platform is. Right, so I have one final question, Claire, but so don't, <laughs> we're keeping on time, more or less. Um, so I, I'd like to think into the future, right? So this is very much a snapshot of, what, of what's happening now, and if we were to have this panel a year from now or two years from now, I'm, I'm not sure that we'll be, we would be talking about the same topics. And we, in fact, we started this morning with, with, um, uh, with Emily telling us about what hap what's happened in just the last year, and we know that tech epochs only shrink, 
So what kind of future have we signed up for? I mean, what does this mean to both journalism as it's practiced and somewhat selfishly as how should the academy respond to it? Like, how should we be teaching our, 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 um, our students in a, to be prepared for a world where platforms are changing and new things are coming out at, at such an incredible, uh, incredible rate? Is, is radical experimentation now a kind of way of life? Yes. <laughs> I think you absolutely have to innovate and iterate every single day of your life when you go to work. I think you need to keep your eyes open. I think that I would never have been able to have predicted that I, Rainey, right, like who I am, would have ever sort of dove straight into virtual reality and spherical video. And I think that when I look to the future, one of the most exciting things to me as a visual storyteller is that I think the world is going increasingly visual. So if you're a writer, I would encourage you to also think in pictures. And if you make films and you're into stories that are told with pictures, also think about words. So that's really my biggest piece of advice. And I would also say, Mark, and to Emily and all of you who are teaching here, the greatest news I think I have for you is that we are increasingly hiring people right out of this J school and other journalism schools that actually are doing this type of training. And that's where we're finding our new talent. We're not actually finding our talent in traditional places anymore where they have seven or eight years of experience. So this is actually the environment that we're looking at to say, you guys have the resources to teach them what they need to know to enter into my world and teach me, and I can teach them something too. Very quickly, I think that, and we do this in, in our classes here, we need to teach them how to see stories in a different light. Not every, it's a lot of the idealistic journalism students, they all want to write the, the long narrative. Uh, I tell them, you've got to be good at doing a tweet as you will be as doing a total long narrative. And I think we need to see storytelling in various forms and not just as one long story and this is going to be my moment. You could have a moment with a tweet. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, I, I wrote a, a book last year and the, the long form story for the magazine and, and I've been, it was the first time I was ever in print because I'd had a career online and now I'm working solely in video. And so I, kind of to your point, which is like the driving thing is curiosity, I think. Like, so, so if you're a curious person and if you're, if you're not a curious person and you're in the wrong field, and then I'd say perseverance is like curiosity and perseverance are what you need as to be a journalist. And, you know, and then, um, we also, I showed some very serious videos and one fun one, but we also have a lot of like food videos where we send people to um, restaurants and order the craziest dish and we do a thing. And the person we have doing it has never, she's not a, um, like a cinema, you know, like she's not a shooter in any way, um, but she had, she was always great at Snapchat and Instagram and she's just a natural at it. So I guess like use your phones to tell stories all the time, which is, you know, use the social media a lot and get used to it. Cause that's, we're sort of like, this is just the professionalization of, of what main, the mainstream is doing already, so. I think for us, one of the things I find really fascinating at World Service and working on, on mobile technologies is one thing that you know, we're really focused on, which is in the next two or three years, a billion people are going to buy their first mobile phone globally. Um, pretty much all of them will be experiencing the internet for the first time as a result. And if you just put yourselves in their position, that means their experience of the internet is going to be completely different to the education we have had as we've, we've you know, we learned how the internet works through you know, d uh, dial up and desktop and mobile and broadband and so on. Um, and it's very likely that w the internet that they experience is going to be very simple. Um, and you know, it might be that their only experience of the internet will be just you know, downloading WhatsApp and messaging each other. Um, and so increasingly, we're, um, I guess we're gonna be in a world where we're gonna effectively backward engineer content rather than thinking about content first. We're going to look at what's the reality of what they are actually capable of receiving. What sort of devices are they holding? What are the key bits of information that are going to be really useful for them? And then figure out, figuring out what content works for them rather than having a predetermined set of content which we just try and crowbar into their, to their sort of feeds. All right. Well, um, let us thank our panel. This was an excellent conversation. Thank you. Thank you.